researcher and uh, uh, at the Antigua University and SMS group and sustainable material science group. So small introduction. Um, why do we study this? We got the question from the industry, so they are developing a new technique um, where they are implementing phosphoric acid up to temperatures of uh, 160 degrees Celsius. And of course, they, they encounter corrosion of their reactors. So now they are looking for materials which are more resistant to this environment. And um, for the moment, in literature, you will only find like lit uh, studies of uh, temperatures up to 100 degrees Celsius. So there was a gap, and we saw an opportunity, so that's why we study this. So we considered two uh, corrosion protection mechanisms in this study. We looked at preservation, where we uh, use the lowering elements in your metal to protect your uh, low metal from the environment. And then we also considered uh, inhibitor addition in your environment so that you can um, inhibit the corrosion of your metal. So the aim was to um, understand the corrosion in such an environment, and therefore we studied six materials. We looked at arsenic, stainless steels, and nickel-based alloys. And then we tried to analyze, uh, analyze the, the role of the chemical composition on this corrosion reaction. And we, did some, we started doing some preliminary studies for inhibitor addition, and uh, we looked at magnesium. So this is still a study that's going on, so these are the first results. Our uh, experimental procedures, so as I said, we had six materials. We started with arsenic stainless steels, so we have the 316 l which is well known, and then 316 titanium, where uh, some titanium is added to the 316 l um, overall uh, composition, which gives the structure some more um, stability at elevated temperatures. And then we looked at super arsenic stainless steels, so these have really large amounts of nickel and chromium, so it's almost no steel anymore because you only have 30 something uh, percentage of iron, but okay, they're still called steels. And um, this had like quite a considerable amount of copper, which could be good for your corrosion resistance. And then the, the Sineco 35 had 6% uh, of molybdenum, which is also uh, known to be really good for corrosion. And it's three times as much as for the typical 316L. Then look at the nickel-based alloys. We had Hasselo G30 and Hasselo G35. Um, G30 had like a lot of components which are interesting and which were highly alloyed. And then we had G35, which had an, uh, a considerable amount of molybdenum in its chemical composition. So how did we do corrosion testing? We tr we didn't risk doing um, electrochemical testing for the moment because these conditions are quite extreme. So we started with immersion testing in concentrated um, um, phosphoric acid, which is the 85 weight percentage. And we looked at elevated temperatures being from 80 to 160 degrees Celsius. And we immersed for 48 hours. And then we did, uh, we calculated corrosion rate by weight loss measurements. We uh, checked for pitting by SCM analysis. And then we also did some EDX to look at the deposits on our surface. So yeah, our grade of acid, there's some impurities in it, so they also influence the uh, corrosion behavior, and we stirred our solution. Um, here you can see our setup. So we have um, our, our beaker with our solution, which is dipped in an uh, oil bed, which is heated and stirred by this uh, magnetic stirrer. And then we have a condenser on top to avoid too much evaporation of our solution in the environment. The corrosion rate was uh, calculate like this uh, from the weight loss measurements. So the results. Um, so what we did was look at our range of temperatures and the different materials, and we calculated the corrosion rates. And there we found uh, yeah, these values. And what we first saw was uh, we defined the corrosion rate limit of 0 0.55 millimeters a year. That was also the prerequisite from industry. And then uh, we saw that the, the Haslow G35 gave really good results, so they had a, a very high uh, molybdenum uh, content, so that was the first observation. To give a little more oversight in these results, we made some, some graphs. Um, what we could conclude here was that under 140 degrees Celsius, you had the Haslow G35 and the Sunny Code 
35, which had the lowest corrosion rate, these boats showed the highest amount of molybdenum in the chemical composition. And then after that, these go up really strongly. And then we had other materials that were more interesting at 160 degrees Celsius. We had G30 that stayed quite stable over the temperature range. And um, additionally, you had Celico 28 and uh, 360 titanium, which showed quite good results um, compared to, to the other estimates. The, the G30 was one that was strongly loaded with molybdenum and also copper, and it also had some tungsten. So these all influence the, the corrosion behavior and its resistance. So these curves or these calculations rather give the, the uniform corrosion rate, so it's, it's calculates how much millimeters is disappearing of your surface, but it doesn't say a lot about pitting. So we looked at SCM images to characterize the pitting of uh, the samples. So this is the G160 L. We see that pitting occurs like the point of this is at 120 degrees Celsius and then at 140 40, the complete surface is eaten away or, or, or uh, there's a breakthrough of your passive film. Pion 16 showed quite the same behavior at, at 120. There was already, there was not just simply pitting, but already some more damage. And then also at higher temperatures, your film is completely put um, down. Then Senegal, you see a different behavior. At 120, there are only some small pits and some etching of your surface. And then you have a partial breakthrough. <coughs> at 140 degrees, and then 160, 170, your surface is completely um, eaten away. What we saw in the previous materials was that the pits had a really specific geom geometry. So we had some um, nice shapes, and then uh, they really depended on the crystallography of our pits. But uh, we would still want to be BSD to confirm this um, an observation. If we then look at Senecor 35, you will see another behavior where even at 150 to 40 degrees Celsius, the surface is quite, still quite smooth. And uh, we only have breakthrough back at 160 degrees Celsius. So that's the one with the uh, molybdenum that was quite high. So you have your resistance to your cone corrosion and pitting. G30 shows pit formation at a higher temperature, so even we went to 170 degrees to see what it does. And it's mostly pitting, but it seems deeper than um, the, the previous cases. So we should look into this a little more um, closer, because that's the material that was quite constant over temperature. But at least, so the uniform corrosion doesn't increase, but you see damage um, forming which in, in the form of pits. And this can be even more dangerous because pits can um, make for uh, cause perforation of your reactors, and it's also a big risk. So this we still have to characterize a little more in detail to see if these go really deep, yes or not, and what's the risk there. Another picture of, of the deeper pits. And then G35, finally, you see that it's, there's almost no or little um, really breakthrough of your film. And what we encountered here, and also already at some lower temperatures we saw it, is that there's a, a film forming, which is visual, visualized by SCM, and we could identify it by EDX. And these were uh, indicated that there were phosphates on our surface, which deposited on our surface, which could um, explain the good corrosion behavior or the resistance of our material, uh, as phosphates would inhibit further corrosion. So we have the conclusions here of the role of chemical composition. The molybdenum is known to be good for uh, general resistance to uniform corrosion, also to pitting. And then we saw like a formation or the indication of formation of protective phosphates, which could have an interesting role, but should still be um, confirmed. And then we have the copper and the titanium, which also indicate to be like the interesting elements in this situation. So they get like a better resistance at high temperature. <coughs> if you look at literature, then we found that um, copper alloyed steels have the tendency of uh, dissolving first the other metals, and that copper or copper-enriched film forms on your surface. 
and as such, um, it's, it stops the further dissolution of your metal. So it's this really the copper that protects then your metal. And um, based on our, our, our study, we cannot confirm this, but I think if you use like more surface uh, sensitive characterization techniques, such as X XPS and Raman, you could characterize the fault layers and confirm the corrosion um, resistance mechanisms. We also tried because yeah, maybe you can um, confirm it by numerical sim simulations. So I have colleagues which uh, who work with FactSage, which can give you like the advantageous phases um, on a thermodynamic basis. And also here we had some first indications, but these are really the first uh, uh, studies. And also we saw that phosphates are stable in these conditions and could form on the surface. So it's an interesting pathway to focus on the deposition of these phos the phosphates. And finally, we also added uh, some magnesium as a pro corrosion inhibitor. So um, this is a graph depicting our results. So what we see is that magnesium mostly plays a role at higher temperatures. And um, it's the, the inhibitor um, efficiency increases with the increasing magnesium or more or less, because here they are approximately the same. But we still have to repeat these measurements to confirm the, 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 the reproducibility. What we did found was that at these higher temperatures, where we see that it's most efficient, we saw some magnesium deposits um, in, the, in the shape of magnesium phosphates. So again, these phosphates come back and um, are, are believed to form like a protective layer or are incorporated maybe in your passive film and as such protecting your surface. So it's a, it's a good way to, to um, work further with that. So the conclusions is what I mostly just told you. Um, the, the resistance to corrosion of the different materials depends on the temperature range, so there will be different mechanisms working there in the passivation uh, capacity. We have the difference between the pitting and the uniform corrosion, so we have to watch out for pitting because that can be quite critical, and it also proves that you need to combine the SCM with your, um, with your uh, immersion testing because you need to confirm pitting. And then uh, molybdenum and copper seem to be really interesting chemical composition elements because uh, the formation of phosphates, and then further on magnesium acts as an inhibitor, and we should look more into that. Thank you. That was it. Questions, please. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, on the pitting size, uh, triangular half pitting size, uh, are you showing sure that pitting or maybe uh, inclusion dissolution? Yeah, we really looked into that and we, we never found, like, it was on all the different materials, and then uh, we, we never found, uh, also when characterizing our materials, we didn't see that much. Inclusion and they were, were quite big, the, the, shaped, mm -hmm. um, the shapes, so we, we concluded and we also looked at EVX and tried to, to search for, because that was our first, our first idea that it is because of the solution. But we found it in all the grains and they had really a typical geometry for every grain they were in, so that's why we related it to the software orientation. And could you uh, just remind the um Chloride content and uh, the surface preparation. And, and the phosphoric acid? And the surface preparation of, the, of your specimen. How do you so prepare your, the surface of the specimen before immersion? We, um, we polish them to one micrometer. Okay. And uh, the chloride content? Of my surface. No, the oh. chloride content of the solution. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Because we also studied in, in, but I didn't show it here, but we tried different um, uh, different compositions of or different purities, and we are also looking into that because we expect to have the need to have a big influence. We are taking all this there, yeah. So we have under what the desert. 
So for you, the pitting is initiated by which species in the solution? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm still. They say that that even such small amounts of chloride could already have that effect because it's really aggressive environment. Um, the flu fluorides also are known to have their effects, but indeed it's quite a uh, small, um, yeah, small presence. So I still have to work that out. <laughs> you have a suggestion? You can only share. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, well, question? Question? yeah, yeah well. I have a more, maybe very naive question on, on like, even for the 316L, um, you don't have uniform uh, erosion, right? So, um, so there's some inhibition layer, right? So still uh, occurring. So, so what is it then? Uh, like, why would that be? Because it's, it's basically, there should, it should not be any kind of oxide layer, and you do even the grinding before you uh, put it on the submersion. So why wouldn't that, that be just homogeneous? Uh, there is uniform corrosion. Is it? I thought even for the 316L you saw there, uh, the, the, this, this actually strong uh, petting effect. And, uh yeah, but the thing is that uh, from the from the curves here, which is a general trend of your know, uniform corrosion, because you see how the millimeters per year that are that are dissolving. And on oh yeah, that's what you call uniform. Okay, then I, I just look at it from a micro mechanical, from micro microscopical. Uh, yeah, view. and then if you look indeed at the micro. Well, but the, the, uh, then, yeah, but the, the thing is, you don't see it that much here. But if you look, you compare it to your glass, you know that some is dissolving. So it's it's dissolving. Um, so even at 120 degrees, there's uniformly. I I I think you can but or see it by the fact that your sample surface is being etched, so you you start seeing your veins and your green ah, okay. So you have sure. some um, some part of your surface that is uniformly um, way of being. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's also what I would expect, but I just looked at the image and I thought that it's more uniform. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'd like to thank you again.